Kiteshire Radio, keeping you informed. Demerara and Essequibo 99.1 FM. Burby's 99.5 FM. Kiteshire Radio. It is 19 hours 30 all across Guyana on this Saturday. Welcome down to a special edition of Room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio and Leonard Gildari. They are awaiting their esteemed guest, Mr. Sanjeev Datadin. But in the meanwhile, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening to you, my friend Kevin Smith, and good evening to Joshua Van Sleitman. I know he's at home today. Uh, lucky man. I must say, and good evening to the entire Kaito Radio crew that's working hard behind the scenes to make Room 592 possible. As I also say, good afternoon to my co-host, Leonard Gildari, and to all of you viewers and listeners from across the country, wherever you're joining us from, welcome to Room 592, where we unleash the truth. Leonard, it has been a very hot evening, my friend. How has been the weather, the temperature near where you are there has it been any cooler in terms of the political temperature than it is where i am well definitely not uh, everybody's paying very close attention i mean the weather in terms of the weather um uh, the rain has eased uh, but when it comes to the temperature the temperature of the political climate it has gone up uh, octaves higher to use the uh, music and talk about temperature there to mix it up uh, that is because uh, it's 18,000 and you and I and our guests are going to look into that a little later. But what has happened now? The elections report uh, for the Reconc report, uh, uh, that is now before the GCOM chair and she is studying that. There has not been a formal meeting yet with the commissioners to discuss that. I believe that may happen tomorrow. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed, but definitely uh, by Monday we should have a very clear idea what it is. But it's a lot of pages, I think I was just going through it. Um, it's showing the regions by regions, and in essence uh, 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 a description of what would have transpired in, that or in those regions as according to the Chief Elections Officer, Keith Lowenfield. Obviously the coalition, the opposition has come out and they are very um, upset about what they've seen here, uh, Yog, um, and they have uh, stated that he has no authority uh, to uh, uh, to do observations like this. This should be a matter for a petition, an elections petition, but there's several sides to the story. I must tell you that we did invite um, uh, Mr. Darren Wade and a couple of others, but they are very busy. Uh, things have come up tonight. They're having meetings and so on. And so we don't have those persons here. Uh, but over to you, Mark Yog. Thank you, Leonard. And just before I say welcome to our guest for tonight, uh, Attorney at Law, Mr. Sanjeev Datton. And ladies and gentlemen, let me let me disagree with Leonard. Leonard, I I, I don't I don't like your your aspersions, there, my friend. Um, you know, uh, you have said that uh, you know this this uh, this uh, report by Lowenfield. Um, you know, you have called it a certain way there just now. I don't like it. I'm, on, I'm going to put a different uh, way on it, uh, a different thought on it. Look, Lowenfield had an opportunity to redeem himself from what he did on March 14th. He has shown this country, he has shown everyone exactly who he is. Notwithstanding an opportunity to redeem himself, he has come out and come out swinging and come out swinging for one side. He obviously has a horse or some meat or something in this game. I must tell you, Leonard, again, just before we ask the opinion of our learned counsel, I must tell you, it is my humble opinion that if, well, number one, not if, number one, Lowenfield's uh, um, uh, opinion of the observations was on call for. No space for that. Number two, if one were to say that, okay, he has space fit, Lowenfield just threw all of his returning officers and his polling officers and, and all of these people under the David G. Bus. They must all, and I'm going to take private attorney if I have to and file a private action if I have to as a citizen of this country, because if those irregularities, if those frauds did take place, they must all, whoever perpetrated those frauds, must face 
the full force of the law. We cannot have this kind of treasonous action take place without repercussions. And thirdly, Leonard, Mr. Lowenfield, in my own view, has, while having had an opportunity to redeem himself, chose to walk down this path, chose to walk down this road. And there are many uh, hypothetical situations and many hypothetical scenarios we can play out. But before we get into those things and before we look at what ifs and all of that, you know, I want to welcome Mr. Sanjeev Dattadin. And ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Geldari will be entertaining maybe one or two calls later on in our show tonight. If you have any peculiar or particular question, while we didn't tell Mr. Dattadin this, um, you know, we certainly are going to put him on a spot. But if you have any call, any particular question or clarification you seek, please call in. Mr. Gildari will be sharing the number. It's also on screen. Sanjeev Dattadin, attorney at law, sir. Welcome to room five. And to my apologies for the late call, but it is what it is. Good evening, you. Good evening, Leonard. Good evening. good evening to your viewers and listeners. And of course, good evening to my beautiful wife. Um, it's, it's an odd thing. Um, you, we, we, we've seen this before with Mingo. We've seen, um, I, I've heard what Leonard was saying at the very beginning, some strong language and some strong things. But um, quite frankly, what's going on evokes a lot of emotion. The Guyanese people are saying to themselves and they're saying um, very publicly about what's going on, wh why why are these things going on and why isn't there some uh, form? Don't we have any public officials in this country with integrity? Don't we have any of them that act fairly, do their job? I mean, that, that's all we want them to do, to do your job. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the problem is. Uh, we, we, we seem to ha be struggling to find public officials that will do their job every day we spend hours of time on radio, on television, discussing whether they will actually do this. And we hear all the discussions of what the law is. And then invariably, we turn up with them pretty much doing what they want to do. And it, you begin to wonder why. I mean, the, the law is very clear that Mr. Lowenfield has a role to play. But Mr. Lowenfield's Lowenfield's job is to do a tabulation of the recount from the 10 regions that have been declared. The, the 10 regions of the recount have been done. We have regions 1 through 10. His job was simply to add it up. As the saying goes, he had one job. One job. Just total it up and, and say this is what the national votes are and this would be the allocation of seats. I have looked... I've made an effort today and I have obtained from um, uh, the declaration, well, no, the CEO's report in 2015 and 2011. Mm -hmm. And in both of those reports, it's a mathematical thing. Regions 1 to 10, it, it, it was worded this way, you. It says, it says basically, um, these are the figures and please find attached this statement, the tabulation reports for Region 1 to 10 to support it. And mm -hmm. that in accordance with the statute, the allocation of seats are as for, uh, this is the number, this is how the allocation is, this is what we, um, this is what I think is the allocation of seats. That's as simple as it was. Okay. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay. So um, with regards to, well, it was a two-part report, wasn't it, uh, Mr. Datadin? It was one, the matrices, and then a summary of the observations, right? Yes, but if you actually look at it for what it, mm -hmm. what it did, Yog, it is mm -hmm. astonishing. The first thing is, is that it was not asked for. And the second thing about it is there was no place for Mr. Lowenfield to do it. He had no authority to do it, and he was not asked to do it. So there are mm -hmm. two sides. One, it, no one asked him to do it. And two, he had no authority to do it even if he was asked. The second, then you go one stage further. He made these decisions based on no evidence. 
he took into consideration irrelevant things. Um, irrelevant evidence is what he took into consideration. So he took the irrelevant considerations being, he took the complaints and the observations without any proof attached to it. He then did the, um, he ignored the fact that these objections were all objected to and he ignored the fact that there was no proof for him to which he goes. So he took into account irrelevant considerations and he also ignored relevant considerations. So he, all of this was done. Mm -hmm. Then if you look at the report, he says that he finds that it's not credible. His opinion doesn't matter, sadly. Mm -hmm. um, and he says also in the report that the on infected boxes by these anomalies, which he has imposed upon himself to, to do. He says this self-imposed thing, and he changes the count. If you were to follow Lowenfield's figures, and this is only my addition, and I, mm -hmm. I could have made a mistake. I think the election results he once declared is something in the region of 125,000, 128,000 for APNU and 56,000 for the PPP and the smaller parties get nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's a two thirds of parliament he really thinks has happened, mm -hmm. if he's correct. I mean, that's right. preposterous. I mean, if you take his figures, APNU one region six. But, but, but Sanji, just stick up in it. I, I'll stick up for one moment. That two thirds, if that is, if that is what the numbers are, are bearing out to be, it is also sinister, isn't it? Because you know what two thirds in parliament does. Yeah, changes it is the constitution. Very, yeah, very, very sinister. And it means a party with two thirds in, in just for our viewers and listeners, Mr. Smith said that it, that it would be better at explaining this, but two thirds of a national assembly can make laws, break laws. They don't, they don't need, they don't need anybody. They can amend the constitution, all the constitutional entrenchments. The only uh, two thirds is the highest. And the only thing beyond that is a referendum. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they might be so bold as to have a house or mouse referendum and abolish all. I know a lot of people might be, mm -hmm. including myself, I was too young for that. I read about it, told about it by uh, those events by uh, my father, mm -hmm. explained a lot of that to me. But um, the reality is that's the risk. And two thirds majority of parliament is a very dangerous thing to have. But it, it, it begs the question, you know, all of this that was going on, it was not um, unknown of what mm -hmm. was transpiring. And Mingo has been uh, or is a dark spot on the history of Guyana. And surely Lowenfield would have seen that Mingo was caught out in the end. And what he was saying cannot be justified. And what he was doing could not be justified. But what do we see happening? We, know, mm -hmm. we saw one man, Mingo, hijack the entire process for APNU to declare a victory. And now we have a, another man who is doing exactly the same thing. He's hijacking the process again. $8 billion is spent of taxpayers' money for this. And if one man can just choose to disregard the law and then that becomes it, then how does that happen? Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Do we not have any person of any integrity any longer? Do we not have persons of any... Uh, no public official has any respect. No public official has any regard. What has happened to, to Guyana? How did right. we get here? And, and Sanjeev, I wanted to jump straight into it. Uh, the order that was issued to make this recount uh, possible, what does the order say with regards to the role, one, the role of the chief elections officer, and two, with regards to how the commission, and uh, uh, maybe even, let's go even further, what, what the chairperson, the role of the chairperson, what the, how does it address or don't address it? Basically, what the order says is, that Mr. Ming, uh, Mr. Lowenfield is supposed to prepare a report of 
uh, the, the votes, the tabulated votes, and he should give a summary of any of the observations he has. Now, it doesn't mean he give a commentary on them. He gives a summary. So I receive uh, or, or 150 objections were made as to migrants, 500 objections were made as to dead people. That's what you would expect in the summary. And what he's supposed to do is present that to the commission by today. And the commission has to consider it and then tell him whether to present the final the statutory information which he has to do by on pursuant to section 96 of the uh, representation of the people act and by doing that he would then submit his report uh, to them and they would go mm -hmm. so i right? wanted I, I wanted to ask you was there a, and this is me as a layman talking was there any contemplation? And let's look at some outside scenarios here. We assume that there was widespread uh, 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 fraud within the elections, and there's going to be a recount. Was there any contemplation at all for somebody who doesn't know for how the uh, any observations uh, or anything that anomalies or anything else that would have come up, how it was to be treated? How does the order treat this? Um, and I, I want you to address that because there seems to be a lot of confusion as Leonard, to whether or not. Leonard, if you look at his report, mm -hmm. his report declares that the PPP won by 15,416 votes. That's what his report says. He then takes it upon himself to inject, because if you, his report has two parts, right? He has the, the words part where he has. Mm -hmm. And he has the, uh, the charts, which he has in his report. And I think it's been circulated. Everyone has seen it. If you look at his report, he has the recount figures accurately reflected as to what he had. And that part of the report is what the law says he must provide to GCOM. And in fact, it is part of the order of what GCOM said we would like you to provide to us. So he did provide that. He provided the, the figures of the recount that we all know. The PPP won the election by 15,416 votes. He knows that. He then went and volunteered this opinion about the elections not being credible and the elections not being uh, fair. So he is trying to say that I have all this information and I have, he takes it upon himself. That's not part of his mandate. He was not required to give an opinion. He does not have the information upon which he can give an opinion. You, it, this is the equivalent of, of a situation like this, Leonard. Um, you are dear and I came in to you and said, um, you took $5 from me. You weren't there, so I said that. You didn't ask Yog if he took the $5 from me. You didn't verify that I had $5 to begin with. You haven't bothered to check if Yog has $5 on him. You didn't check if Yog was present. You didn't check if Yog and I were ever actually present together for him to do it. I'm just giving you a scenario. And you then produce a report that said, you took $5 from me. How did you come to the conclusion? I could have been telling you a lie, yes. um, but you can't come to a finding. You can't make a finding based on that. Now, the part that he, ex he went beyond his mandate for was he went beyond his mandate to say about whether the, the elections were credible. But he had no basis for coming to that conclusion. They Sanji. were, Sanji. They were com observations by uh, um, APNU, but those mm -hmm. uh, observations have no, nothing to support them. And here is, here is where I, want, I would like us to, to deliberate a little on. You have been 
a litigator for a long, a, a good while. Um, I don't want to make you sound to be old, so I changed long while to good while. You, <laughs> you, you have, you have been, you know, pleading cases in front of of the best of judges, included, uh, including the CCJ. Sanji, for for Mr. Lowenfield, first of all, it seems like this report was the handiwork of more than one person, and I'll tell you why. On part one, you are seeing they say that a total of XXX votes stand to be impacted by voter impersonation. Yeah. On another section, yeah, on another section of the report, you are seeing a totally different section. You are seeing so much for the 4,225 votes were impacted. It's a decision. It's a very different language. Now, yeah. so, so it seems like there was more than one author to this report that was thrown together. That's one thing I want you to comment on. The second thing, Lowenfield had five days. It seems like in these five days, he documented all the allegations of um, fraud, allegations of voting. But the man has done an investigation and he has examined evidence and he has made a decision he, Lowenfield, has become the judge, jury, and executioner. Your comment, sir. Well, he has. But you see, um, the, in, my, in my opinion and in, in my assessment, this is, uh, if we take it from um, as relating back, not only to your question, but relating back to what uh, Leonard was saying earlier, if we are to take it, and, and just for a moment, forget the, the issues in, in the general terms, but if we are to take it strictly back to public law and public law principles, we start with the fundamental things that all public bodies created by a statute are only entitled to do that which the statute permits. For example, magistrates are creatures of statutes as well. They are statutory bodies. So magistrates don't have the same power judges do. Magistrates have no inherent jurisdiction to do anything. Judges have inherent jurisdiction, to be fair. Magistrates have no choice. They have to apply the law as written in the, in the books. They, they, don't have the, the, they don't have the discretion that a judge would have. But the, the position of all of that we should appreciate is that public bodies, GCOM is a public body, the office, GCOM is created by a statute and the constitution, the office of CEO, chief elections officer, is provided for in the statute and the constitution. So these are statutory bodies. He did do the part of the job he should have, which was the tabulation of the votes. And that's what he was entitled to do, and that was what was requested. Yeah. What should happen, and GCOM as a public body should disregard everything else that he has done because he doesn't have the power. But that's what the law says you must do. A public body must receive from you all the information they're entitled to, and they are to deal with it what they're entitled to. What they're not entitled to as a public body they have to leave at the door and they have to move forward with only the information and the, whatever it is that they are entitled by statute to address. Mm -hmm. If they are not entitled by statute to address it, they have to say to you, you have to take it to whichever tribunal or forum that you have to, to do. Let me give you an example, and I don't want to give people ideas because I, 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 it's not a great example that I'm telling you. But the reality is this, if there is a land dispute, if let's say Leonard and Yog, the two of you have a dispute over a piece of land, and as a result, God forbid, you get into a fight about it. Now, the fight would be obviously go to the magistrate's court. Mm -hmm. But the law is that if you have a land dispute and a fight com uh, comes about it, etc the magistrate has no jurisdiction because the high court is seized with the land dispute mm -hmm. already. And you might have been very civil with each other and it might have degenerated into two cutlasses, etc. 
But the thing is, only the high court has jurisdiction. So what the magistrate can do is receive everything except about the dispute, the land dispute. But once they have ascertained that fact, they have to tell you, go to the high court and let them deal with it. Now, it, the same is true for what GCOM should, should address. GCOM should take from the report that has been that the information provided by Law and Peel and say, well, these are the numbers that you have. But as it relates to this other part that you are uh, addressing, then we have to go to another forum. That other forum is, of course, the, the High Court. So that's it's, what it's, should happen. Seems like you have blackout there too. But uh, <laughs> uh, yep, we have, everywhere has got blackout apparently. I I, I think yeah. um, I think the boys in our studio arranged that to GPL. They have some kind of one only alliance with <laughs> that. But yoga, mm -hmm. there's no. there is b before you move on. There's something that we should take note of. Uh, a few moments back, or or maybe uh, 20 minutes ago, the Attorney General. Uh, Basil Williams, the Minister of Legal Affairs, would have sent out a statement. The headline for that, and I guess we, it's pretty long, uh, GCOM's jurisdiction enables it to resolve irregularities, discrepancies, and anomalies. Um, and it goes on to, to, to say basically this thing can go to court. GCOM could deal right away with these issues that have been raised by um, uh, uh, Keith Lowenfield. Um, I am just walking for my glasses so that I could give you a little bit of information from what the Constitution says. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Careful, meantime, about, careful meantime, about taking things from the culinary, well, Basil Williams. But I'll tell you this. Yeah. Our Constitution, Article 163, and I'll just read you the, ba the basic part. It says, subject to the provisions of this article, the High Court shall have exclusive jurisdiction to determine any question A, is regarding the qualification of a person elect to be elected a member of the National Assembly, or B, whether either generally or in any particular place an election has been lawfully conducted or a result thereof has been or may have been affected by any lawful act or omission. And it says that this is the exclusive jurisdiction of the court. Of course. Now, this is what the Constitution says. So these words, any lawyer would know that when you, when you have a statute that says the exclusive jurisdiction of the, uh, um, is vested in the court, it means to the exclusion of all other entities, persons, bodies, everything. No one else. The rule is the express mention of one thing in a statute is to the exclusion of every other thing. So if you mention jurisdiction is exclusive to the court, it can't be vested anywhere else. GCOM has absolutely no power. Mm -hmm. to engage in anything to do, either generally or in a particular place, an election has been lawfully conducted or the result thereof may have been affected by an unlawful act, act or omission. Mm -hmm. well, and I think I that th falls squarely into what Lowenfield has exceeded his mandate into doing. And that too mm -hmm. should be that he, he's not empowered to do that. Mr. Williams's argument is, is premised on subsidiary legislation, which he has opined here, is that Order 60 of 2020 is subsidiary legislation. I mean, uh, we can talk more and more about it, but I think to our viewers and listeners, what he's uh, imputing there is that because it's a, you know, because the, the overarching constitution and legislation is more senior to this being a subsidiary legislation than you would go back to. No, uh, okay. Let on. me explain to you. Let mm -hmm. me just explain to the viewers so that they understand. You have primary legislation, which is the act of parliament that is usually passed, mm -hmm. etc. You then have subsidiary legislation, which are things like um, regulations, um, 
you know, sometimes when you pass legislation, you then have regulations as to how to implement the legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and you have like the high court rules and, and things like that, which gives you procedures for doing things that are empowered to be done by statute. Now, what GCOM did was GCOM passed a resolution and they wanted the world to know and they, they put it in the Gazette. Mm -hmm. So everybody has that it's gazetted. Now, if we take it, this preposterous position that the mere fact that you put something in the Gazette makes it subsidiary legislation, it means this yoke. Your transport and, and Leonard's transport that you have for the property is subsidiary legislation. So at any time in the future when you need, when you would like to sell it or do anything with it or give it to your children, remember you have to go to parliament. Because mm -hmm. subsidiary legislation, like primary legislation, can only be amended by parliament. So that would also mean mortgages mm -hmm. that are passed in the and advertised in the Gazette would be subsidiary legislation. God forbid the bank wanted to do something, they would have to go to Parliament as well. Mm -hmm. um, trademarks for all the trademarks and trade names mm -hmm. that Kaichur News own, we own, they would have to go to Par <laughs> <laughs> They would have to go to Parliament to do it. Can you imagine that if everything you advertised in the Gazette became subsidiary legislation, what would happen? Yo, Good point. All of the transports that are added, all of the transports that are uh, added to the National Gazette are done by private people. Lawyers file it in the registry and it's sent. Do you know yeah. what we can do if we can change laws that way? It is preposterous. It is the stupidest, most childish thing I have heard from a lawyer. It yeah can't be so and it's certainly what he is saying about gcom's powers they have no power and the chairman the executive was they so has no power to do what it is but you see this has been an apnu narrative for some time the apnu narrative was we will do what gcom says we should do but what they've managed to have GCOM do so far, uh, Lowenfield, is exceed his mandate in a manner mm -hmm. that is very helpful to them. But I don't think that that is anything to be too worried about in the grand scheme of things. Because I think the commission, uh, especially the chairwoman of the commission, is smart enough to realize that she wouldn't act on things where he has no mandate and she should stick to the powers that are contained in the Constitution mm -hmm. and have a report based on the numbers of the recount, which we all saw and we all know represents the will of the people, and make a declaration based on that. So, Sanjeev, um, Ramesh has sent a note here, and, and um, your, your opinion, of course, is sought, um, that, you know, the framers of, of Guyana's Constitution, um, you know, contemplates you know, all sides of things. And this is why you have a 163, for example, so that it, it places things definitely within the ambit of the court and, and exclusively within the ambit of the court. Your comment? Well, um, yes, the framers of the Constitution are presumed to have thought of everything. Um, but to be honest... But they didn't think of low and field, right? <laughs> no. But the, 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 this provision that we have, in fact, Yog, is common in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And all of the Westminster style constitutions that have been inherited from England um, in the new in the independent countries. Mm -hmm. And it is common because even in England, a few centuries ago, what used to happen is when you ha it, it, the theory is Parliament is, in fact, the highest court in the land. They just mm -hmm. don't hear uh, disputes anymore, but they are. In England, for example, the House of Lords still hear disputes, but mm -hmm. they, they've moved away. They now call it the Supreme Court. Anyway, that, that's different. But basically, Parliament is the highest court in the land, the Speaker, the highest mm -hmm. judge. Mm -hmm. And that's the theory that used to happen. And what okay. used to happen is when there was any dispute about what goes on in Parliament, it had to be determined by Parliament itself. Mm -hmm. And in fact, many things that go on 
as we found out in the in the past few years has to be adjudicated upon by the speaker and problems within parliament um, punishing a member doing anything is exclusively the jurisdiction of parliament and parliament the implementation and enforcement of parliamentary rules is exclusively for the speaker to do not the courts the courts have no jurisdiction there however it was thought that when you came to issues about adjudicating upon the membership and upon how the members got there in the election, that to have them and their friends sit there to decide on what was right or wrong was not helpful to the population. Mm -hmm. So Parliament in England took a decision 200 odd years ago that what will happen, well, more than that, 300 odd years ago, that what would happen is they would give this jurisdiction to a court. And the reason why they gave the jurisdiction to the court, the court got rules, you know how to file the proceedings, they got rules for evidence, they got burden and standard of proof how that works, you know, all these things mm -hmm. that they're capable mm -hmm. of, you know, doing can be done. Because how would you take evidence at GCOM, for example? How do you file it? A letter? Do you, right. I mean, what is the burden? Who administers the oath? All these simple things become very complicated. So Parliament decided that it would be better to have an independent agency do it, which was the High Court. And the High Court inherently has the procedures and rules so that it could do that. Mm -hmm. That being the case is why the exclusive jurisdiction to determine these things about elections fall to the court. Because you don't want to have put it into the parliament, but you don't want to put it into a body that mm -hmm. set up is such that it would not be able to adjudicate upon this. For example, we should remember, I know that Justice Claude Singh used to be a judge, and people think, well, because of that, she can adjudicate. Well, she's not been a judge for more than 10 years, and she's not sitting there as a judge. She's sitting there as chairman. Well, what would have happened if this had happened with Dr. Steve Search Valley? He's never a judge. So mm -hmm. what would happen with the two sides being deadlocked? They cancel each other. What would have happened with uh, Major General uh, Joe Singh? He's never been a judge. What would have mm -hmm. happened with Rudy Collins? He was a diplomat. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how would that have worked? You can't become or you can't get jurisdiction to adjudicate on it by virtue of the fact that the chairwoman is a former judge. That, that would be preposterous. Right. But you, you have no rules in place as to what she would do. She is obliged, the chairwoman that is, uh, she is obliged to follow the law. Wh which is where... To the law, which is where we are, isn't it? That you, uh, that, that, you know, it is widely believed by the legal minds like yourself, of course, that um, you know her her remit um, to to act is very limited. The scope is very limited, and she's not a court. So so yes. to adjudicate to your point. Yes, continue, please. You see, one of the things that happened was this, and I see it, and I've heard it said only today. Um, this is one of the things, right? And we must accept what they. The argument was, how did, how is it the PPP was able to go stop Mingo um, and get his declaration set aside if the court had no jurisdiction? And how is it that we argued in the Ho Hollander, the second Hollander case, mm -hmm. that, um, that we could have, uh, by Section 22, GCOM can amend its own uh, amend legislation, etc., mm -hmm. if they needed to be. Now, you have to remember one thing. They could amend and take steps if they wish to hold the election. That's where their, their might lies in holding, leading up to before, mm -hmm. not afterwards to amend and to do things. That's not possible. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing is what Mingo was doing was not following the law. And if you're not following the law, the specific provisions of the law, the court would have the right to judicial review. 
Okay. But if you, what the court, and, and Chief Justice George said it very clearly. She said, I don't want to hear numbers. I don't want to hear what he came up with. What I want to know is how he came up with what he did if he followed the law. Mm -hmm. So you can't, uh, you can't take it to court until, for, for anything to do with that, until the end of it. Mm -hmm. But you see what's happening here is we have a public official who's not following the law again. Let us hope the GCOM, the, the commission itself, obeys the law. Because once right. they do that, we're okay. Yeah. But, but Sanji, you've come, let's, let's come back to the, to the language of Low and Fields reports. Um, look, the, the, let me just share this with some of our viewers and listeners who might not have, have um, seen or might not have read the reports. One can look at the, the, the report for, um, hmm, we are at Region District 4. And Low and Field reports reads as follows, the part number seven, a total of 466 ballot boxes stand affected due to a total of 1,862 anomalies and or alleged voter impersonation and unreconciled ballot boxes. Let me repeat, alleged voter impersonation and unreconciled ballot boxes. So that is clear what he said there. However, for the same District 4, he concluded against the backdrop of using the word alleged, he has now concluded, finally, the summation of anomalies and instances of voter impersonation and unreconciled ballot boxes identified clearly does not appear to satisfy the criteria of impartiality, fairness, and compliance, blah, blah, blah. First of all, it is not his place to declare unfairness, impartiality, and compliance. That, that is what we have been deliberating thus far. But isn't there a dichotomy there then, Sanjeev? On one hand, he's saying something, and he's now concluding based on... Yeah, on and, and it, it probably demonstrates what you said earlier of multiple persons being involved in the writing of the report. But on, on both counts, it's irrelevant because... Both of those are an ex him exceeding the mandate which he has by law and exceeding the mandate which the commission has asked him to discharge. Okay. So he has taken it upon himself to embark on a process um, that he has no mandate to do. And what the commission should do is disregard that. Mm -hmm. And they should make it clear that they are disregarding it because he has no authority to submit but, that to them, but, but, and they should consider what he has the authority to submit. But Sanjeev, when we talk about the commission now, we are obviously talking about one person only, and that is the mm -hmm. chairman. Yeah, because like, the other three, the government and opposition cancel each other. I, I mean, even me as, as, as an independent person here, I think I know where this report was written, or who's been the, the intellectual minds behind the construction of such a report that shows multiple personalities and multiple writers. But let's talk going forward, uh, Sanji, because you mentioned something important enough. Can, is it, how do you want to put this? The, the can, uh, let me ask you, can the chairman disregard portions of this report or must the chairman disregard certain portions of this report? Well, I don't ever like to tell any public official that they must do this and that because they, they might just decide to do the other just to prove but, me but, wrong. But you are the guys but, that says may <laughs> and shall, you know, you are the ones yeah. that say may and shall. But the law, <laughs> Give them an the legal approved. position would be, the legal position would be, Yoke, that um, the chairwoman is obliged to apply the law mm -hmm. and to obey the law. And in obeying the law, she cannot countenance a elections officer, a chief elections officer who has disobeyed the law. So essentially, to the extent that he has exceeded his mandate, she should ignore that part because he didn't have the power to do it and commission didn't ask for that. But the part that he does have the authority to do, which was to submit the, the tabulation of the, the, the numbers, she should have regard to that because he has the power to do that. And mm -hmm. in public law, as in many things, uh, the principle of severance applies. Whatever are the 
the things that he's lawfully entitled to do, then he, you, you have to respect that. And the parts that he's not lawfully entitled to do, you could strike those down. That would be the approach in a court. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that what it is now, I know it is a, a supremely uh, improper, unfavorable position to be in. And uh, it's to no one's benefit to have a chief elections officer who is insistent on exceeding his mandate in a manner that is so partisan. But um, at the same time, Guyana as a country must move forward. And in moving forward, what we're trying to achieve is an end to this election. And he has submitted the, the numbers. And he has submitted that the PPP has won. And I think everybody and their neighbor knows that the results are that the PPP has won the election. Mm -hmm. That being the case, I think we should move forward with that. And he should be asked in accordance with the order that was passed by the commission. He should be asked to present a report in, uh, in accordance with section 96 that sticks exclusively to his mandate. And his mandate would be, of course, that he is to do the tabulation of the numbers. Mm -hmm. And GCOM should make it clear to all the parties that all of their objections and all of their concerns about what has gone on must go to a court. And they should file that, uh, that application and get it heard by a judge. Right. You know, right. it's not that they're not going to do that. You, you know, Yog, I'd said it before a few nights ago on your program, and it's the same thing now. The reason for the anxiety is because the coalition that is presently in power does not want to give up. So they have invented reasons. They have continuously invented reasons as to why they should remain. It was first that from the no confidence motion is because of all the things of holding an election. Then they went on to say, uh, well, Mingo did the declaration, so we won, we should swear in. Then that was stopped. And then what happened after is the recount. And they are now trying to, to say the distance, the recount from truth. And they have come to say that the recount is not so. But mm -hmm. if they have to raise these problems of what the ballots are saying versus what they are saying in their objections, it means GCOM would make a declaration and they have to go to court to reverse it. Mm -hmm. That would of necessity mean that they would be out of office while this is being. Right. And um, they don't want to relinquish power. But mm -hmm. I don't think there is any human being, including them, that believe that they have proof of all of this. They keep talking about it. Why don't they show it? They will never show it. Like their mm -hmm. SOPs, they will never show it. They will keep coming and inventing narratives and playing, pretending to play on logic to deceive people. That's all this is. Plain and simple deception. And mm -hmm. they will put their soldiers out and the accomplished pirates to repeat the narrative. That's been the mm -hmm. game plan all along. Okay, so l let's let's do an off the pitch um, kind of, of thing here now. Um, scenario one, Leonard. Mm -hmm. um, scenario or, or hypothetically, we can say one. Um, there seems to be a total parry in this report made to the chairman to declare a no result, to declare a null and void election. Um, Sanjeev and, and Leonard, if there is a no declaration, if the chairman were to be so, uh, I don't know how on what basis of law she can ever make that um, declaration that is null and void, but if she were to make that, we know, and I wish to say this, we know that GCOM cannot hold an election till God knows when. So it means that somebody who's making a push for GCOM to make a no declaration, they know fully well that they want to remain in power until GCOM says it would be ready. So let's deal with that uh, hypothetical scenario one, Sanjeev. Is there such an option available to the chairman? Well, uh, 
the first thing I want to say, Yog, is in, in your hypothetical, it's not possible. The chairman has to declare a winner. Um, mm-hmm. That is what the law says. GCOM has held an election. They have ballots in their possession. They have counted the ballots and they have recounted the ballots publicly. They have to declare a result based on what they have seen in the ballot papers. They mm-hmm. can't choose to just disenfranchise the votes of the citizens. They can't take away my vote just because they, they're not satisfied or this or that. They, they, that's the cardinal rule. You can't disenfranchise. But mm-hmm. if you are to go down the... So that's not a possibility. Let's be clear. Mm-hmm. Legally, that's not a possibility. But, but, but if we on, are but, to go but, down the road, if we are to go down the road, that let us say that if that were done, mm-hmm. then we would get to the 12th step of never. I mean, it would literally be up, you know, what kind of creek without a paddle. Mm-hmm. We would really, because this all started from the no confidence. Cabinet didn't leave. They continued to do it. Um, the authority was being exercised as if it was a government not a caretaker government, a full-fledged, ordinary government. They proceeded along those ways. They governed in that manner. They made arrangements. They sold land. They did all these things as if these things, uh, as if it were going on. Then we come to the second stage of of things, which since the election, uh, again, there there's no obedience to the constitution or the law. It, it's mm-hmm. made up as we go along. And people say the most ridiculous and preposterous things, and they just go along with it and say, well, mm-hmm. okay, we're obeying. And then, so if they go to that situation where they say, well, oh, um, there's no result, that will just be going further down that road. We are going to be so far from the shore, I don't know if we will ever be able to navigate our way back as a country, because who will call the election? Mm-hmm. Parliament is already has not come back so how how is the proclamation issued to dissolve how is the date for election set uh who remains in government while all of this happens what would be the function of gcom if they can't run any this election what makes you think they will be able to run the next one if we follow what low and is saying are we going to do house to house house to house being specifically not permitted by our law any longer only as a means of verification we have continuous registration that's what should be, that's what is uh, the applicable law now. Are they going mm-hmm. to remove persons from the ballots? Are we going to have any budget? We're right now bankrupt. People are struggling. Um, how do we pay our bills? Um, do we get access to the, the much talked about oil money? Because it's mm-hmm. been deposited in, a, as I understand, New Jersey State or New York State Bank. And right. it's never going to be accessible until there's a legitimately but, legitimate government in place. But Sanjay, um, but Sanjay, let's things, come. How would that happen? Yeah, let's let's come back to what you said there, because if you say, I mean, uh, what you are saying there is true that a hy- the hypothetical scenario one that I posited, um, it, it's it's highly unlikely because of so many questions thereafter. But here is the hypothetical scenario two. The report contains it. The report contains, law and field report contains both of these things. One is that the chairman is being persuaded to say it's 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 um, null and void. And two, if the chairman is not persuaded to, to say null and void, then the chairman is presented with another scenario that is to give the PNC two-thirds majority in parliament, which then negates all your problems and all your questions because they... <laughs> They could just pass whatever laws they want because they have two thirds. No, well, uh, it's uh, it's not so much that that's basically that's what they're saying would be the in in in. I think those figures are more used for him to say scenario one that the elections mm-hmm. are not credible, which is the excessive demand it because he does provide the charts mm-hmm. and he does provide the count that came out of the recount. And the PPP won by 15,416 votes. So that has been, that part is put. But he has readjusted to say, if we do this readjustment, this is what it would be. But as a result, I don't think that it's fair and credible. So he's not really, in my mind, entirely trying to do that. What he's trying to do is create confusion. 
and he's creating confusion where he is confused. And where he is confused, his opinion doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We don't need him to, to resolve it in his mind. We don't need him to act on it. What we need him to do is tabulate the 10 regions and present it to the commission. Mm -hmm. You see, Article okay. 177 says that you are deemed the president if you are the person who gets the most votes. You are deemed the president. And the chairperson, the chairman of GCOM shall so declare. And it goes on to say, on the basis of a, 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 a report from the chief elections officer. So what it's saying is, the chief elections officer is obliged to give you, the chairman, the proper count. Mm -hmm. That's all it's saying. It is not saying he has his own right to prepare his report and go to Magic Kingdom and come back with Mingo. He so, can't do that anymore. So let me put this what over he must to you. Do, mm -hmm. What he must so, do under 177, you have the most votes. Mm -hmm. He must put his report that you have the most votes because that's what the count is. And the chair, chairman of GCOM is commanded, the chairwoman is demanded by the Constitution to deliver that. If you look at 177, that's all it means. So Sanjeev, hypothetical three, um, hypothetical scenario three. Um, the chairman declares, based on the numbers in front of her, she declares uh, PPPC would have won. And the APNO presidency and the APNO person say, well, we don't accept that because of what Lowenfield wrote here, and we will stay in power. Well, they can choose not to accept it, but they won't be able to stay in power. They might want to use law and field report. And, and if I were to be honest with you, I think that's the main purpose of the things being written into in law and field's report. I don't think that what's written into law and field's report in this set is to yield a declaration in favor of APTU. I mm -hmm. think what it's really to do is to give fodder to the court proceedings that will follow. Mm -hmm. I, I, I might be wrong, but my view is that Lowenfield has given the numbers, which he is mandated to do, and right. as a result of what he has given, I think the declaration will be made. I want you to know, sir, Mr. Attorney at Law. I want you to know that our president said last night on another media house. He said, "Quote unquote." We know what we are doing. Well, I tell you what was my big concern when I heard that. Um, my concern was that um, I don't want to say too much and get myself, but <laughs> my concern were the ducks were in a row. I heard mm -hmm. it. It stood out like a store thumb, and I thought to myself, the ducks are in a row. Thank you but, very much but for that. The, mm -hmm. But is is that what you thought as well that hard when you heard it? <laughs> I didn't hear that one there, but when you say docs in a row, I want to tell you a couple of things there. But we go ahead in a very short while and open the lines. Um, and of course, with your permission, Council, I think there's a lot of questions that people want to ask you. Um, there's, uh, there yes. is right now... Um, in our WhatsApp, um, to our WhatsApp phone six triple two triple two. Could you ask Sanjeev if the Swain Ali is president rather than waiting for Claudette Singh? If there's a possibility. Um, well, I, I tell you what, um, Leonard. Given the the realities of what's going on, there are all kind of things. If um, of what can happen, but if we stick to what the law is, the law is the declaration must come first. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done in the future to ensure that non-biased, non-partisan individuals are put in positions such as a CEO and a chairperson of GCOM? Will the PPP pursue criminal charges in the court against individuals aligned with their electoral fraud and trying to thwart the will of the people? I don't want to speak for the PPP because the PPP is a structured party with leadership. I can tell you if I have a voice in anything to do with that, I will say yes. Um, persons who have put this country through this should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Um, 
not in a witch hunt, not to go, uh, you know, finding persons just to do these things, but we've all seen what has happened and, and there should be accountability. What mm -hmm. should happen in the future? I am a great believer in transparency. So all of these reports should be publicly presented. All of the deliberations um, from all of the deliberations that are being done by GCOM should be public. What they're saying when they're at GCOM and what people should hear, people should see. I, I tell you what, one of my professors is a, more an economist than, and, and known in the oil and gas circles, Sir Paul Collier. And, and he uses an example frequently. And he's, a, he, he's convinced me. I, I don't know if he's the same believer as I am. But he says, if you were to walk in an empty parking lot and you saw $1,000 on the ground or 1,000 pounds on the ground, he says, the chances are you would pick it up and you might do, not say anything about it. It's there. Nobody's around. There is no way for you to determine who it belongs to. You might pick it up. He says, however, if there was a camera in the parking lot, the majority of people unprompted would pick it up and try to take it to find the owner. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't, whether the camera worked or not, was irrelevant to the concept of it. Of it course. was that you thought someone was looking. And when you think someone is looking, you usually would do the right thing. And I think that the way it has to be is the powers of the officials in GCOM and what they're doing requires more transparency. I also believe as a result of this election that if during an election cycle there are objections made to specific officers and their involvement in the process, as long as those objections are with foundation and they're not mm -hmm. just frivolous, I think those people should be excluded. There were, uh, there were concerns about Lowenfield, Myers, and Mingo, because those were the people seen by the PPP perceived before to be the persons mm -hmm. that they were. And if that is indeed the case, then I don't believe that you should have them involved. Why are they so peculiar to the process? Maybe it is time that we find, I have been doing some reading, and in some jurisdictions in, uh, that I found mainly in the Asian African countries, that um, the person, the chief elections officer, there's usually two, mm -hmm. meaning he has a guard. <laughs> so both right, sides right. would but, have but someone Sanjeev, there. Sanjeev, it so there are matter. legislative, to answer you, there are legislative mechanisms that we can engage. But what these elections have taught us as well, Sanjeev, is that, you know, if somebody really wants, like what Mingo did, like what Lowenfield has done, they just totally ignore whatever regulations and whatever laws are there, and they do whatever they want. And the issue here is that we have never had, for all the past atrocities, nobody has ever been prosecuted. Nobody has felt the, the face of the law. Now, um, here is my next thing to you, and this has nothing to do with Lowenfield's um, um, report. But as a citizen of the country, you know, as of yesterday afternoon, Mr. Granger held himself up. People call him sanctimonious. He held himself up to be above, above everything else. Um, and while he held himself up to be above everything else, the rest of the party started to say whatever they want to say. But as of last night, he basically embraced everything. He, you know, now we are seeing that maybe he is one of the intellectual authors behind the scenes because he has come a full circle and he has embraced and he has made, he is covered for Harmon, he is covered for everybody and all the allegations in his mind now seem to be cast in stone. Yeah, I, I thought that was indeed telling. It appears that uh, Mr. Granger has come out and he has owned it. He's claimed... Mm -hmm that he really knows what's going on. Again, another reason I thought the ducks were in the row. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, correct. 
So, Leonard, I think you want to take in some calls? Yes, we will. And um, before we do that, uh, there, there is a comment here. I was away for two days, joining the program now. I feel like I just wake up out of a coma and I'm on Pluto. What madness in Guyana. So if you want to call us and you want to hear what madness in Guyana, maybe put in your two cents, 226-7453. You call us on that. You WhatsApp us on 6 We're going to take your calls. We want to hear uh, in room five by, in 592. What are your thoughts on elections 2020 and exactly uh, with regards to the report uh, that would have mm -hmm. been tendered to the chair of GCOM, Justice Retired Quartet Singh today, and some of the developments on that. There's a caller in line already. Good good evening, caller, you on the air. Hey, good evening. Good evening, sir. As I am concerned, citizen, observing the elections since the 2nd of March, it's appalling to see the level of disrespect that the administration has shown towards the electorate. I mean, I've listened to the program quite often, and sometimes I don't agree, and sometimes I do, but I think the job that is being done by Mr. Mario is very pleasing to us as Guyanese. We should, we should all acknowledge the wrong that is done. The, it doesn't matter the party you support or the, um, what did you say, your, your political view, but wrong is wrong. Wrong cannot be right. I can't see how come, after all this, we are at this, the same position we started after me. Because this is where we are today again. The declaration, the, um, the report by Mr. Lewingfield showed blatant disregard for the population, for the people of the area. There is no justification for that report. His, his accusations is just accusations as the APNU. They are not based on fact. They are accusations without, without any, anything to support it. And I cannot see how come somebody who is supposed to be intellectual who's supposed to hold a post, could put those things in a report. You cannot put mm -hmm. here, see, in a report like that. You have to put facts, proven something. If nothing is proven, there are accusations. How can you put accusations in your report? It doesn't make sense. I think you guys need to, I mean, clarify these things because it, it, it is, it is, it is, the, the simple word is stupid. How can we move forward from this? You, you, you're, you're talking about cohesiveness, you're talking about, um, inclusive governance, but then you're disregarding the people. How how are we to move forward when it is shown that there is no regard for the other side? It is just that the mm -hmm. idea of one side is being put forward. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it is, I, as, as I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my early thoughts, I, I, I supported the, the, the ASC, I was, a, I was a member of the ASC, I was part of the party, and then I left, the reason I left was because of the coalition, because I, I, I started collating with the PNC as before with the WPA and the, the UF. It would never bring nothing good. By collating with the um, PNC, the party mm -hmm. to lose their voice, and we saw it today. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, any other thing? But, yes, we, we, we have to understand there's no way of moving forward if we cannot come around because if we allow as Guyanese allow this to happen, we allow this election to go void, how can we trust that GCOM or this government would provide a free and fair election in the future? We could never, ever, ever. Well, um, yes, thank you for that. Thank you for election that. Because the same core powers are there and the same mechanism is there. So how, how? It is, it is impossible. We need a credible result Thank you. based on what uh, people ask for. Thank you very much, yeah. Carl, and uh, let's, we are going to address make the topic. calls. Let's make the calls very brief um, yes. to the point, because we had a lot of people coming in. But to that caller's point, that yes. is indeed a good question, caller. Yes. That is, you know, if, if this is allowed to happen, it means whoever forms the next government, God forbid, will never be able to get them out of office because elections just wouldn't matter. 
Right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Yog Mahadeo. If you're now joining us, room 592, and it's been hosted by Dr. Yog Mahadeo and myself, uh, Leonard Gildari. We have with us here attorney at law, uh, Sanjeev Datadin. And if you're calling us, we want you to call us in. We want to hear about elections 2020. Short and sweet, ask the council some questions with regards to what has been uh, with regards to this report uh, uh, by Keith Lewinfield, Chief Elections let's, Officer, to the let's chairperson? Hope, let's, let's hope Sanjeev doesn't send his bill to you there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, I am broke at the moment, and uh, other people are broke too, including the country. So, over oh, there's a call online. Good, good evening, caller. You're here. Yes, good evening. could you lower your volume? Could you lower your volume on your radio? Hello? Could you lower the volume on your radio, please? Sorry? Could you lower the volume on the radio? Thank you. It's lowered? Yes, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. I've got a question. I've got a question. The gentleman there with, with you is whom? That is a Tony at Los Angeles. That is, and he's also a candidate for the People's Progressive Party, Civic. Okay, fine. Now, he just said something to me. He just said something that actually kind of confirm my thoughts. Now he said, if you went in a car park, you found some money, and you know that there's no camera, you probably pocket it. But if there's a camera, you will try to find the owner. Now why would Mingo in front of the world try to rig the election? I, I, I I am not. I did. I wasn't. I'm not there seeing it. I was listening to you guys on the day, and I was shouting no. And I had a sleepless night. How can someone so brilliant try to rig an election in front of the whole entire world? Now, your gentleman there really? said more or less the same thing. And then everybody, everything seems to be upside down. People not being there to say anything. The chairman, and I do have faith in her. I think she's a very nice lady. I always did. And she's not saying much. What is really going on? Mm -hmm. What is going on? Why every time there's uh, an election, everything goes upside down with race and everything? And people sit on the sideline and see the citizen stir each other up. Any question, I'm sir? Yes. I'm a person who, who, from a little boy, believed in, in a one-party state. People tell me if you have that, you'll have a dictator. Not if you have strong people, strong citizens to actually mm -hmm. make sure that the goal will go right. Anyway, Thank you, sir. that's my say. I take... Thank you guys you. have a good night. I've been enjoying your show, and I don't believe most. Oh, by the way, Leonard. Yes, sir. You mentioned a gentleman named um, a few weeks, a few yeah, a few weeks back, Mataya Mohammed, Malaysia, a brilliant man, the most truthful politician there is in the world. Thank you, sir. He yes. Said, he said there is no politician who isn't corrupt. I thank you very much for that, sir, and I'm going to throw that uh, right away to uh, uh, our attorney at law here, who happens to be a politician. Are all politicians <laughs> corrupt, sir? I can't, I can't uh, get no, away from no, that. No, 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 come on, come on. <laughs> our, no, 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 I'm not even going to ask uh, Mr. Datidin to, to comment because Mr. Granger, our president, campaigned on a platform of honesty and integrity. Come on. Come on, Leonard. No, no, no. I can't, I can't miss this thing. Sanjeev Datadin is here. He's a lawyer. You can answer it. I don't no, 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 to answer, not, man. What, What's wrong with you? What, what I would say is this. Um, the, uh, I know the caller made reference to the thing that if there is a camera, then the person is not likely. You have to realize that the, the whole test, apparently it was a test and, it's, uh, uh, and it was a test that was done. You have to realize that the thing was most people will not. There's mm -hmm. still people who will still take the money and couldn't be bothered whether you saw it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Very a reality. 
that's mm-hmm. a reality. But the, the, the thing is, wh- how, where do you stand? What's your best chance? Right. Your best mm-hmm. chance of transparency is to open it up so that everybody knows. No secrets. That's always the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's not only in elections. I think it's the way for Guyana to get out of its current difficulties with allegations of corruption and difficulties that we have with public confidence in the institutions we have. We need to open them up so that people can actually see what's going on. As to why you would want okay. to rig an election in front of the camera, um, I am not so bright. I, I don't know if you gentlemen want to take a shot at that. I will tell you why it is. It's, it's, it's because for, I honestly think, and, I, and I, I've had this conversation with quite a few people, no one actually believed that the outcry with what was going on would have been to the extent it was. And I think the media has to be thanked principally for that. Mm-hmm. The coverage, the live feeds, the live coverage that was done by, mm-hmm. by some of the media houses, the larger media houses like Kaito News, but some of the one-man shows, some of mm-hmm. the one-man operations that were there and carrying things live, um, and people would see it. And sure. what, what happened is that motivated persons and it, it excited them mm-hmm. in an outrage almost, where mm-hmm. people spoke up and they fought. And when the pushback came, I think after the Mingo spreadsheet plan, there might not have been a, a, a discernible um, concrete plan as to how to go about trying to rig the elections after that. It's been a plate by ear and take whatever avenue opens up. Correct. Sanchi, if I want to come back to something very quickly. Um, I, I've been looking whilst you were making your commentary. I was looking at a couple of things. I want to read to you the closing, the sum, final summation for Region 10. District 10. Um, This is in Lowenfield's report, and it reads, Summary of Observation Reports for District 10. Mr. Datadin, it reads as follows. Finally, the summation of anomalies and instances of voter impersonation identified in District 9 clearly does not appear to satisfy the criteria of impartiality, fairness, and compliance with provisions, blah, 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 blah. Um, It cannot be ascertained, ascertained that the results for District 10 Upper Demar Barbies meet the standard of fair and credible elections. So uh, based on this, there is not a region or district then that meets criteria um, of, of to, to, to satisfy low and field. That's one. And you can clearly see cut and paste uh, at work here because, you know, they, well, this thing about... Yeah, yeah. But, but the important part to note about that, Yog, is this. What happened was he has he's exceeded his mandate by doing that and you should simply disregard it notwithstanding mm-hmm. the obvious cut and paste error it should be dis- it should be disregarded because he is saying it does not meet the standard of fair and credible elections what is the standard and how did he become the arbiter and what standard is he applying from from where and why now mm-hmm. you see the the the, the thing is he does not have the power, and that should be entirely disregarded. We should stick to the numbers, and I hope that the chairwoman does as well. I, and mm-hmm. the thing is, you see, this is all part of the chicanery, in my mind, designed to, to excite a court. Mm-hmm. You know, this is it. So, so let me remind viewers and listeners out there that before we ask Mr. Uh, Datadin to come on tonight, we did extend an invitation to persons on the APNU AFC um, slate too. We did invite, and I would really love to see, um, you know, I'd love to have Mr. Anil Nandlal here together with Mr. Joe Harmon. The two persons, from, you know, a person from each side come here probably tomorrow night, um, or to have, you know, to ask whether council here can, can return and have somebody on their side. We have been, ladies and gentlemen, we have been extending invitations to persons from APNU AFC to come and they have not as yet. We have been mindful of Mr. Gunraja's position in the, co- in the commission, and we have not. We have not asked him to come here as a commissioner. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, Sanjeev, regardless of how we turn this or twist it, regardless of all the verbiage, Leonard, that we want to use here, it is left to one person, Claudette Singh, to decide whether she is going to allow 
the legitimate expectation of the voters in this country to have their votes counted or not. It is left to one person, and if it is left, as Sanjeev Dattadin said, if it is left to that one person to, to, to Claude Singh to make that determination, then Claude Singh has to make a declaration um, because only the High Court can listen to a petition concerning these elections. Am I, did I summarize it right or wrong, that, Council? That is indeed correct. I, I, I think, I'm getting there. I think I'm he, getting there. He's, he's getting there. But let me tell you, <laughs> during this elections, elections 2020, um, and even you go back as far as December the 21st, 2018, since from that no confidence motion, I think the Guyanese people were schooled in the Constitution. You learned some words. I think they even coined some words like fabulation comes after tabulation, Ooh. some very good things. But here's a yes, question. Fabulation. Here, fabulation. You must also, you must also, it's good to quote your source, you know. It, it's good to quote where you got your stuff. Hey, I'm hey, hey, calm down. No, 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 you, you got to calm down. We, we're not um, obligated <laughs> to name sources here. Eh? Uh, hi, good night. How come on the, on tw in 2015, when they were taught to three fake statement of polls, Law and Field did not say that the elections weren't credible, or is it because APNU won? I'm just putting this out there. There's a caller online. You guys could answer after this. Good evening, caller. You're on the air. Yes. Hi, good evening, guys. Good evening, sir. So I've been following you for quite some time. Probably uh, we're at day 100 or something. And I called you maybe a month ago. And I congratulated you guys for your hope that you continue to have. Um, you know, but... It's unfortunately that we're here now. I actually was trying to call you guys uh, on your more famous program on, on the midday program the other day when you had the APNU uh, recounting tabulation agents. And I heard, I heard some shocking things. And one of them was about Mingo's declaration still being an alleged fraud. And it was very, um, it was very disturbing for me that anyone run, running for public office could still say something like that is an alleged fraud when the official declaration has his signature on it. And for any public official listening, I want them to know that once you put your signature on a document, you can and will be held accountable by it. And you can't later come and say that this is not me and me and no one. Some, um, <clears throat> they were, he was, I think what they said was he was simply tabulating votes given to their, him by some agent or some clerk. So that is nonsense. Um, I just want to keep it brief. Why I didn't have hope a month ago is because Guyana, from since even before the no-confidence motion, has been on the path of becoming, in my opinion, a failed state. And I would like you gentlemen and your viewers to note that there are 23 countries in the world that have more than 60% of the export earnings that are based on oil production. And not a single one of them is a democracy. And that is not a coincidence. So I'd like you to take a moment to reflect on that. And I see um, the Learned Council, Mr. Dattin in there, and I'm sure he's thinking about all the legal recourses he could take now. But <clears throat> I think we've seen clearly up to this point the law and the legal avenues that we have have been quite mm -hmm. ineffective. Um, so I, I continue to not remain hopeful that we'll see an end to this, even through the courts. And mm -hmm. for me personally, I think Guyana is pretty much split in half. And you have a lot of the coalition Thanks. supporters that are still back in their government because they want to see them in power. The only time I could see or foresee the government conceding to their feet is when their own supporters start turning against them, when, when, they, when they start to suffer just as every other guy needs. So that's right. my comment here for tonight, Thank and you. I, I wish you guys well and continue to fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zia and uh, let, me, let me just say this. So, yes. so I, I'm going through the report here, and let me just put this to our viewers and listeners out there. Put it this way. Um, low and field is much better, much is a much better uh, person. And I'm not being facetious here, Mr. Dattin. Mr. Low and field is a much better person than Mr. Mingo. Mingo ended up removing 
uh, about how much? About 3,000 votes from the PPPC, I think. Right? And adding, and adding 23,000. And adding 50, episode. yes. But what Low and Field has done is remove a hundred, over 100-something thousand from the PPP. In fact, in Low and Field's report, APNU has one reason six. In yeah. Low and Field's report, the most amazing, this guy has to be much better than Mingo with everybody watching on, everybody listening to the recount, everybody hearing all the fluff from one side, but Low and Field has given APNU an even bigger victory than Mingo did. And so let's, let's put well, that... <laughs> but the, the truth is, eh, is he does declare the correct numbers and he does put the reconk numbers. So let's give him credit for that. That's what his job was and that's what he did. He well, got a little excited and went beyond his remit, so we should ignore that. And that is really what it comes down to. It comes down to a simple process of accepting what is legal and severing from it that which is illegal. So wherever he exceeded his mandate, just sever it and move on. Because the country has to move forward. We can't keep going around in circles. So we, we're one step closer and we're one step uh, further down the road. And Mingo's numbers that he declares are the recount numbers. So we accept it and we move on. So now it's for GCOM to say, well, present a report on that and let's get a declaration. Absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. But, room. But, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go on, Leonard. Go yes. On. So room 592 here with Dr. Yog Mahadio and Leonard Gildarian with our special guests here this evening, Tony Law, Sanjeev Data in Council. There is a question for you on in the WhatsApp. What if the commission decides to exclude the boxes with the issues as shown by the CEO? Could the court direct the declared uh, figures to be used to swear in the president? Um. The short answer is that, well, let, before I answer, I want to say that they can't exclude the boxes. So as a matter of law, they can't exclude the boxes. So it's not that GCOM can do that. But if what you're saying is if they do exclude the boxes, can the court direct them that they ought to take it into consideration in doing the count? Yes. I mean, if that were so, but I'm saying that there is no position there's no legal basis. You see, you see, we got to go back to the fundamental always. That usually solves every legal uh, problem that you're facing. The fundamental is, can you take away the franchise? Can you take away the vote? Now, you have got to have very good reasons to prove that my vote that I did is problematic. And it falls foul of the law. Other than that, you can't take it away. That's the reality. And what you have to remember, if you find one problem in a ballot box, for example, the poll book is absent, that don't mean that you discard all the votes you find in it because one document, you're telling me an official of GCOM who is being paid to do a job, don't do their job possibly, and as a result, you take away my vote? That would be preposterous. So if you open the box and they don't have the, the poll book, you can't find the poll book, you take away the votes. If they don't have the official list of electors, which should be in there, or the folio, or they didn't tick off all the links. You see, there, was, there, was, there were issues with the, tick, the, the list that ticks off all the voters in some cases because what happened is the presiding officers collected them back from all the persons, the party reps that they had given them to. That should have been left with them, but in some cases they wanted it back. I don't know why, but they'd take it back and put it in. Now, when you go to the bathroom or when you were eating, you might have missed a couple. The presiding officer might have missed a couple, so the numbers would vary a little bit. You have 10, I have 5, or I have 8, and Yog has 11. Those things could happen, but those are not legal requirements. Right. You know? Those are not legal requirements. And they don't form part of the record keeping, the folio. So these sorts of things you have to understand that not because an official from GCOM who is a public officer did not do the job in the exact letter and line of the law, you can take away all the votes in that box. Even in the issue of the East Coast, 
where they were if where there were boxes where only the ballots are in the box and that was because they received an instruction from a DRO that that's what to do and all of the documents were put into the poll bag now you have to you have to understand and that's why people going there was very important especially with people who had not been involved with it before like myself i had not been involved before to that extent but when you get on election morning you get a box which has the ballots and some some of the things and you get a poll bag that would have mm -hmm. the seal and the stamp and pens and things mm -hmm. like that. so there are two docu two things that you get what they were told is put it in the poll bag they put it in the poll bag they returned it to the GCOM. those documents have been accounted for and they have been located right and as far as i'm aware it's been accounted for for all but it wasn't put in the box but nobody's mm -hmm. nobody is saying that it was you know thrown away or hidden or, it wasn't put in the box because somebody mm -hmm. took it upon themselves to do this now let us understand this so all those 7000 ballots that was affected by that approximately 7 you're saying you will disregard it how could that be possible the people mm -hmm. so that if that were so then every ballot box in this country you could have someone do something untoward with it and you will disenfranchise the nation right and, and don't the, forget the, too the, it's that not these... that simple for you to take away people's votes right. and don't forget too that the, the people you're talking about are gcom employees those polling officers those returning officers they are gcom employees they're not any party agents they are low and fields employees he had supervision over everybody. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I know we're going to get down to program time just now, but I want to say this. Uh, with, Leonard, with regards to, with regards to Lowenfield's uh, uh, report here, there is something we need to make very, very open and clear to everyone. Lowenfield has pointed to his report, in his report, these uh, irregularities and these anomalies. However, we have to remember no independent observer were, uh, none of them were allowed to check that those ticks were indeed ticked. This is all within the privacy of GCOM. No independent observer was allowed to supervise when GCOM said something was ticked off or unticked, that that was true. There has not been anybody that checked that. And so if Lowenfield says it was ticked, I don't know that I could trust as a citizen of this country whatever Mr. Lowenfield said. And that has to be ventilated to the full because how do you trust this man now after having seen what he has done, knowing the same Lowenfield, knowing that Mingo's report was fraudulent, still went and on the 14th of March prepared a report using um, Mingo's fraudulent uh, numbers. Here he is again, using allegations, using assumptions, and making a decision. Yes, uh, thank you very much. We have been given uh, some time by management. Uh, they tell us that we could continue. A lot of people have been calling. I see Council said. looking at his watch. Council, you got to run? Right. I was just checking the time. No, no, no. They, right. they said that we could take some time because they said that uh, you want to take some call. Good guys. Good day, good night, guys. My question is after the declaration is made and it is confirmed that Dr. Irfan Ali is the new president. Can the PNC file an injunction to stop the swearing in? To you, Council. The, the Council yes, is my Is there? Yes, I'm here. No, my my uh, my earphone just fell out. Sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Did you want me no, to read back the question? Saying, yeah. Good, good evening, Sorry. guys. My question is that after the declaration is made and it is confirmed that the, Dr. Irfan Ali is the new president, can the PNC, I, I presume this is the coalition, file an injunction to stop the swearing in? My guess is um, I had anticipated in my own mind that that was the likely position of when the approach to the court would have been made. I don't know that the court would have had any jurisdiction at that stage to stop anything happening. An election petition had to be filed. And the injunction, to get an injunction while an election petition is um, in place, very unlikely. Um, it was not, 
I'm not saying that it would not have been filed. My understanding is that was when they were going to file legal proceedings. Mm -hmm. But whether it would be successful is a whole different issue. Okay. And Leonard also wish to remind everyone that look, um, the, the, the PNC, APNU, AFC, um, um, this, this grouping has been consistent. Sanjeev, if it's anything, you can say that APNU AFC has been consistent with a number of things. And let me just outline <laughs> them in one minute to everybody. Look, um, no confidence motion passed, right? The president decided, well, the party decided they were going to challenge whether 33 was greater than 32. Remember all of that history, Guyanese brothers and sisters. Also, I want everybody to remember, as I am reminded here, that Granger went ahead and appointed. This writing was on the wall a long time, you know. It's just that probably we were not seeing it. Granger went ahead and appointed Patterson for the chairman of, of the Elections Commission, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the advice of the Chief Justice. When the Chief Justice gave her advice, her legal opinion to the president, what did he say? He said the Chief Justice has her views and I have mine. And this country had to go through all of that. So this thing has been happening more than a year. We have seen instances where after the CCJ declared this government as a caretaker government, duty-free sale of properties, well, give away of government state, of state assets has continued to happen. We are seeing under COVID-19, even though elections have taken place, we are seeing people using state assets to broadcast their own political divisive nonsense competing with private media. We have seen the RAG, which is the Chronicle, continue to do the nonsense it's doing. And I know I have Mr. Dati in here, but tonight he's not here on behalf of him being a member of the slate of the PPP because I'm insistent we must defund the Chronicle. It happened in pre-2015 with the nonsense of the Chronicle, and it has happened again. And that has to stop. We, taxpayers of this country, we are funding people to I pass us and that has to stop. Sorry, Leonard, I had to carry on a little bit. Thank you very much. And I, I'm not sure whether I'm among politicians or lawyers. Um, um, is there a difference? <laughs> and, and there's a rhetorical question. There's a call online. Uh, uh, if you want to call us, it's 226-7453, 226-7453. You could also WhatsApp us on 6222222. You can read the message. And if you're now joining us, it's room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio and myself, Leonard Gildari, with attorney at law Sanjeev Datadin, who happens to be the candidate or a candidate for the People's Progressive Party Civic. It's a call online. Good evening, caller. You're here. Very much. I'm not sure yes. Could you lower your volume on your radio, please? Sorry. Thank you. My Go question ahead. is simple. Yes, is, sir. Is there any way, this is Director, Mr. Daffodil. Yes, sir. Is there any way that we could, or the PP could have, um, GCOM declare their SOPs? Because I think by declaring their SOPs, that would, that would clarify a lot of things that would, that would, that would either contradict or conform the declaration made by GCOM. That's a question? All right. We, we take it off here. Thank you very much. Uh, Sanji, if you heard the question, is there any way? I'm he not would sure. say if, they, if we could get GCOM to declare what? Uh, the they, SOPs, the SOPs. To release the SOPs. Yes. As long as there are legal proceedings after the declaration, um, I think that they, those are going to have to be produced. Yes. But in terms of before the declaration, um, it would be difficult to do because usually the SOPs are connected to election petitions. You see, the public law duties is there is no duty for them to disclose. That's probably a change that can be implemented by law. Um, something that I have been thinking a lot about, I was thinking to myself, you know, in all of this thing, if we made it, if the law in Guyana was that immediately after the election, as soon as they receive it, GCOM were to declare all the SOPs, a lot of this would not happen. Mm -hmm. But there is no law to require them to declare it. GCOM should, they should have a law that they should do it immediately following an election upon receiving it. 
and they should do it not less than two days later because they will have it within two days. Mm -hmm. And I, let the whole country get out their calculators and add it up and tell them what it, did, what it is. But I guess mm -hmm. uh, there's something that would have to happen. There's a question for you two gentlemen. Good night, everyone, my question. If the chairperson, and I know you would have addressed it somewhat, but let's, let's try again here. If the chairperson declared null and void the elections, what happens next? Well, there is no legal authority for her to do that. But if she does, we slip into this great black hole. We, we have no rules or laws that would guide us as to what to do. We have no way of setting a date. We have no way who will remain in power. We don't know who could issue the proclamation. And proclamation, he must issue a, a proclamation to declare was the date for election. We don't know how any of these things can take place. We are so far from the shore, as I said before. I don't know if we'll find our way back from something like that. Right. Well, the other question that you can ask, Leonard, if if they, if Akno AFC, all the shenanigans from March 2nd to now, um, you know, and they're talking about having fresh elections, I don't know in which country they're going to have those fresh elections to hope to win. Because, uh, you know, across the country, there are small groupings of persons that are drinking the Kool-Aid every day, um, and they continue to drink it, God bless them. And I certainly hope that God continues to bless them. But obviously, a lot of people are seeing what's going on here and are feeling extremely, extremely frustrated. You know, I, I must say this. Look, the, the president, President Granger, is the only officer recognized in law after these elections. The uh, council will correct me if I'm wrong, but in law. He can, of course, appoint who he wants because he's president, of course. But the truth is that you have, under a country that has... A, symmetry, a tremendous health crisis, a severe health crisis, you are appointing a bunch of politicians to manage the health crisis, paying them fancy salaries. You have non-critical ministries still operating, non-critical, still paying and still earning fancy salaries, while people are starving in this country. That's how much they care for the people in this country. Um, uh, there is a question here for uh, the good counsel. Uh, could you say what happened to the declaration that is being held in abeyance? I presume this is a second declaration by uh, the, the, by um, uh, Clement Mingo. Can they use it? Um, the, the holding in abeyance, I guess it's just that they were saying, well, we'll see what to do with it, presumably. But the, the reality of holding it in abeyance, it can't possibly be acted upon now. The statement of recounts, which are done for all 10 regions, have replaced the uh, tabulated results for the previous 10 regions. That was the purpose of the recount. And I understand the narrative that if this recount is, is not valid, you would go and take that, the ones that existed before. But that can't be the position. Because what happened is upon these statements of recounts coming into being, those go. Now, even if you were to say no, it would be very difficult in the face of clear evidence and very clear evidence at the recount that was made public that uh, Mingo's numbers would, would, did not match up to anything that he called out. And there were a difference of probably 26,000 Mm -hmm. votes mm -hmm. um, by plus and minus in plus on one side, the APNU side and minus on the PUP side. You can't possibly declare that as a result for Region 4 anymore. It would have no, that would be wrong. That would pure and mm -hmm. simple be wrong. But to answer what happens to the abeyance, the, the votes, the declaration, the tabulated results in abeyance fell away once the recount uh, SORs were done. Very, mm -hmm. very good. So if you're now joining us, room 592, Dr. Yog Mahadio, myself, Leonard Gildari, and Antonio Los Sanjeev Datadin, uh, candidate for the People's Progressive Party. There's a call online. Good evening, caller. You're on the air. Good. Uh, yeah, good night. Good night, sir. Um, uh, listening to Sanjeev and Dr. Mahadio and yourself, um, I, and the declaration of Mr. Lowenfield, our society, we all know, is a divided one. And um, coming down to the declaration of these results, 
Now that Mr. Lowenfield has said what he said, how is it going to be for those who had voted for APNU AFC when they heard that they have been cheated, when there is going to be a declaration by the, the commission that Mr. or Dr. Uh, Irfan Ali has won the election? I believe this is a dangerous thing. Um, our country will be in serious problem. For those who believe there has been cheated, because Mr. Lowenfield has done a disservice to this country. And we must see this in this perspective. No one has discussed this on your program. And I believe that we should explore and let us see how we tell those people that inevitably there will be a winner and that our country do not go down the, you know, the path that it went before. Mm -hmm. That is what is my contribution time. Thank you very I much. Will, yes. I will tell you this, Leonard. Um, it's a valid concern. Are we going to descend into violence? Are we going to descend into to a state of uh, civil unrest? Um, the realities are, are this. Um, we are still, it is still possible that we will not if uh, the, the right approach is taken. But I would say this, that there is always a winner and a loser and there will be um, some discontent. And I agree that what has happened by what Lowenfield has done and what Mingo has done it, is, it has invigorated people to believe that they are going to be robbed and that will excite them to the point where they will come and, and fight for their rights. But surely they would have realized there's nobody in Guyana that legitimately believes what has happened. Sure, what they have seen and observed and become aware of is this is a naked fight to hang on to power. And if that is what... Uh, the result is in those circumstances when they're fully aware, then it's going to be, have to be something that's addressed and dealt with. And both leaders are going to have to figure out um, what to do. And hopefully better sense prevails than for us to des descend into a state of uh, uncivility. But if the, the leadership must be such. Mm -hmm. And it is also the leadership of APNU that has been leading their people telling them that these are the things. They should have disclosed their SOPs immediately if they thought they had won. would have solved a lot of the problems. But we now understand that, that they don't have you know, given up power. Yes. So, no? Yes. Right, whatever please. happens, I hope peace prevails. But, but uh, it may not. And that's a right. stark reality. So, so we have had uh, Dr. Hines, uh, um, Mr. Um, uh, Lincoln Lewis, and, and a whole host of other people, uh, including Dr. Jeffrey, Henry Jeffrey, who sat um, on different programs and so on uh, throughout the, the Guyana and different, and, 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 and even in the United States, we have people of, of an African descent sit there and give credibility to what Lowen Field is doing. This must be addressed immediately. If we do not do this, then there is cause for concern as to the development of our country upon the swearing of Dr. Ali. If that doesn't happen, then we are going down a serious road. We, we, mm -hmm. There must be a program at some time that we address this thing. Because I can't understand, there, these are doctors. And somehow they believe that something went wrong and that they have yeah. a right to be part of something that up not this is something ridiculous I, I you know I don't know how to put it all right thank you dear call any other point no thank that's you. just, I just thank this you. is something thank I you
Yes, uh, thank you Leonard, very much. Uh, Leonard, yes. Leonard my, my dad used to remind me, and I'll uh -huh. say to, to uh, I'll pass this over to counsel. I'm sure he will use it at some stage in his long, future illustrious career. Um, literacy is not the sign of an educated man. <laughs> I wouldn't say more. I want to remind viewers and listeners, Leonard, that in 1985, history is very important, you know. In 1985 elections, Desmond Hoyt, head of the PNC. The PNC claimed, GCOM claimed that the PNC won 42. Was it 42? Let me just check. 42 seats in parliament and the PPP had eight. 1985 elections, the PNC had won. And we are seeing a repeat here. And a couple of months ago, when Patterson was GCOM chair and when the elections were going the way, I, I had cause to ask whether we had Harold Bollard's, uh, you know, reincarnation and that paradigm. And to that caller just, that just called in, it seems like we also have Polydor's reincarnation in modern day politics. I, I cannot go into more details except to put it like that. And a quick question here for uh, maybe straight to uh, Mr. Datted in my question. If GCOM declares the PPPC as the winner and on the same the APNU or the coalition files an election pet petition, now hypothetically they refuse to hand over powers to the PPPC and claim that they will only do so until the petition is completed. Is this possible and what is the legal remedy? Well, if what has happened is the, the declaration is made and and Dr. Irfan Ali is sworn in, then the tenure of the presidency of Granger comes to an end. So he would have no right to remain there. We have, hopefully, still a civilized society and a police force that will enforce the law. So it will come down to that. If, however, they, um, they want to go ahead and, and file a petition and say they don't want to give up, I mean, it's not within their power to do that. They're entitled to file a petition if they are um, they're certain of all of this, then what they should do is be prepared to go to court as quickly as possible and pursue it as quickly as possible and have an adjudication from the court as quickly as possible. But I have said this before. I find that it is dishonest that persons have seen the same things Persons have seen what has happened. Persons are aware of the numbers. But they still try to promote as if uh, those things didn't happen. And they try to invent reasons which they know they are inventing only for disruption and chaos. But you see, it's a bigger thing that we have to address in our society. And that is the, we can't have the PNC and the remnants of the PNC bully the nation as has been happening before. It's a, it's a harsh reality. It's something that has, that has to be addressed. But there is the constant fear of, of what happens if supporters go on the street. Guyanese are, are constantly worried about that. On this particular occasion, the COVID-19 might have been a blessing in disguise. I want to. I, I want to ask you this personally, um, uh, uh, Yoga. This is a question from from me. There's a declaration on Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning at ten o'clock by uh, the uh, by the chairperson of GCOM. Could uh, this be used by the chancellor without receiving any kind of documentation and in her hands to move right away to swearing anybody, whether it's the um, Granger or Erfanadi? Once the declaration is made by the chairman, the that, convention, I uh -huh. have checked into it with previous chairman and I've looked at what the legal position is. The chairman would usually inform the chancellor to be available. And the chancellor would then be there to swear in whoever is the person declared by GCOM to be the winner. So hypothetically, mm -hmm. while that uh, declaration is happening, the, the chancellor could be standing by and use that declaration as as the official thing? The declaration is the official thing. So there's no there's no need for a, a document or anything to stop that? Sorry, there's no, no need for a document. 
Yeah, but the document is done instant. I mean, simultaneously, you know, they so, they all. So, San, Sanjeev, is is Claudette... for example, mm -hmm. as I've been told by previous commissioners, the declaration is already prepared. Mm -hmm. For both sides, they usually would prepare a declaration, and once they know from the count which word it is, they fill in the names and they print it and they have it. Mm -hmm. Is that so declaration required to be made public, or, or is it a declaration given to the Chancellor? Well, the issue was examined when there was the 2000 election with uh, Janet mm -hmm. Jagan about whether the declaration needed to be public or not. All that is required and came out of that decision really is all that is required is the chancellor has to be satisfied that that is the fact. So the chairman is informing of the truth without, you know, not deceiving mm -hmm. or the person informing her is in fact the chairman and not somebody impersonated. So as long as the chairman is satisfied that that is the declaration, then they are obliged to, to go ahead. The chairman could choose, in theory, to say, let me see your piece of paper, mm -hmm. you know. but Because you, you use a dangerous word. You say the, the, the chancellor has to ensure there is no impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> impersonation of GCOM chairman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's a dangerous thing now. We don't know who and who has been impersonated from, from GCOM's perspective. <laughs> I would like to see somebody but, who resembles a good chairperson. <laughs> but, but the thing about it, Leonard, to get back to your question, you could see why when we step away from the law, how every further step becomes more difficult to navigate. Because the minute we go off the beaten path and the prescribed path of the law, every step has four options, five options. It could be this, it could be that. And then each further step, the permutations are exponential. But if you stay on the beaten path of the law, then there is always only one step next. It, the minute you step off, there is a speculation if this is so and if that is so. And if they do this and if they do that. And if the officer chooses to ignore this or to accept that. It mm -hmm. be, the uncertainty quotient goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. You understand? Okay. But realistically, what we hope, and I hope happens quickly, is that GCOM instructs law and field to say, the commission instructs law and field to say, look, Present us a report in accordance with Section 96 of the Act, which you have to do. We would like the numbers, and we would like to see the allocation. You don't really have a right to give us all these things, these opinions, and you've exceeded your mandate. Keep that to yourself. Present the proper report for us to consider. Thank you very I'm much, Leo. That's the position. Thank all you right. very much, Leo. And Take Leonard, I, I've just You'll gotten a message that says that one of the persons, I'm not going to call any names, but a person from APNU side has said, electoral fraud will soon lead to an APNU AFC victory. And my response is, damn right. Electoral fraud <laughs> may lead to a victory for your party, but elect we know where the fraud exists. It's in GCOM. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Yog Mahadio. And before I hand you over back to the host, let me say thank you very much, dear, to all of our listeners and viewers across this land and overseas, wherever you've been joining us from. Very good uh, 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 comments um, and calls to our program here this evening. You've been very faithful with us, and I want to say thank you very much. And of course, uh, we'd want to say thank you to uh, Attorney at Law Sanjeev Datadin candidate for the PPPC. Thank you for joining us, sir. And of course, I'd give uh, the floor over to Dr. Yog Mahadio, the host Thank of you. Room 592, sir. Thank you. Thank Yog. you very Thank much, Leonard. Thank you, Yog, for having me anytime. Yog, and over to you. Both of you and may your God be with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And do give our regards to your family, Sanjeev. We know that we have taken you away. As always. As from, always, like, from your okay. family for tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you, Guyana has had a problem with math since 2018. We now seem to have a problem with English. I certainly hope our children who are our future will do better at math and English. And, of course, 
comprehension, comprehension <laughs> and analysis. These political battles and these positionings continue. I know, ladies and gentlemen, please stay in tune and attuned to um, Kaito Radio and to our social media pages. We are hoping to put together a program for tomorrow night, depending on what's the play during the day tomorrow. If things continue to go the way they are, or if there are changes um, in the political uh, scene during tomorrow, we are certainly going to bring put together a team for tomorrow night mm -hmm. and continue the discussion in room 592 tomorrow night. So please stay attuned and in tune to what we are saying and doing here on Kaito Radio, YouTube, and Facebook. Let me say thanks to my co-host, Leonard Gildari, and thanks to you all for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. And if you can, when you can, and as often as you can, say a prayer for this beautiful country of ours. If never before, you better do it now. So ladies and gentlemen, stay safe. Remember, you can disagree with each other, but let it don't go further than just verbal disagreement. Stay safe, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye now. All right. Good night. Take care.